Hi, Tea Timers. So today I have a pure jasmine. And um, I think one of the things I love about this tea is I like sipping it, but I also love just like, like breathing it in, you know, the, it has such a delicate scent and it just surrounds you with a feeling of like, I don't know, peacefulness and, um, and like happiness, like it's a faint perfume in, in a real nice, delicate way. So I really like that. So I didn't get around to um, doing the questions. It's been, as you know, this time it can get pretty busy, even though we aren't having anybody here, you know, it, it's a busy time. So I didn't get to the questions this week, but I will. And hello, my new subscribers and hello, my old subscribers. Thank you so much. So um, let's see. So I'm going to answer a question from back in the archives of unanswered questions. <laughs> so let's see. What do I have here? This is way back early. Blofeld39. I'd love to see a video talking about the work you did on Amadeus. I've always wanted to know more about that. Okay. So this, I'll probably, this will probably be several different videos talking about Amadeus. And so every time I'm like, oh, I could answer that one. And I'm like, oh, but that's going to take so long because there's so much to happen. So what I'll do is I'll do little segments of um, Amadeus because otherwise you guys will be here for two hours and I'll still be like, blah, 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 blah. So, um, so what I'll do is I'll first I'll talk about the process. So it took a while to get that film. I was so excited because... Um, when it came up because I had seen Ragtime, which Milos Forman had done. And he also did Once Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And he he's was he passed away, but he is a great, great director. And I really thought, oh my gosh, to work with him, you know, would be so amazing. So I worked really hard on the the sides and I got in to see to do it. And I read quite a few times. It took me six months to get that part. And um and I remember he would have me come to read with different people. So I remember once I read in Los Angeles and I read with um, Donald Sutherland, you know, who's a great Canadian actor. And it's like, whoa, Donald Sutherland, because <laughs> I'm Canadian too. And so, um, and he was very nice and he was very sweet. And, you know, he got all dressed up in Salieri's clothes and um, we were waiting because they were, they were putting uh, us on tape. And um, he told me a story about when he met Stanley Kubrick and, um, he had gone in to see him and he was living, he was in New York at that time. And he had said, I don't care. Cause he was such a big fan. I'll go anywhere. And so he, uh, Stanley was going to be in New York. So he, I can't remember if he flew himself down or he was there, but it was very cold day. So he, you know, got there early, but he put on long winter underwear and he had his briefcase and he was all dressed for the character and he got up there. And then as he was in the waiting room, he started getting hotter and hotter. And he, so he asked the receptionist, oh, where's the bathroom? She told him, so he went in there and he peeled off his long winter underwear and stuffed it into his briefcase. And then, um, and then he came back and he's in the waiting room and, and the receptionist said, okay, he could see you now. So he went in and he said, but you know, I'm really shy. And, uh, and, uh, Kubrick's really shy and I'm a notoriously shy. So we just, I went in like, and I'd really fought to get in to see him. And then we just kind of sat there like looking at each other and uh, neither one of us knew what to say. And, and then finally he cleared his throat and he said, uh, <clears throat> so what do you have in your briefcase? <laughs> and he said, he said, my underwear. <laughs> The conversation really that was a conversation stopper and uh it, you know it, it, and it did go on from there anyway that i remember that about donald sutherland is that we la we had a good laugh about that he had he had had to say my underwear <laughs> um so anyway i read with him and then milos had me go to new york to read so with um so i had he had done me tried me with a couple other uh Amadeuses, and then he had me after he said, would you mind? And I went to his place and we met with, oh no, I didn't. And then I went, yeah. And then there was Mandy Patinkin who had been in Ragtime. I was like, that's Mandy Patinkin, who was a big Broadway star too. And I was like, oh, so I was a little bit nervous. But um, um, anyway, he came and we read a few times and then, and then they went out, we went out for dinner and they were, knew each other very well. And I could tell that 
you know, he was just reading as, as a, a favor to Milos and Milos was um, reading him maybe as a favor to Mandy, but it was a little tiny bit uncomfortable because, you know, he, Milos knew what Mandy could do, uh, but he, I guess he wanted to see if he could be Salieri. And, um, and then um, I, was, I, I thought both of them would be super nice to work with, but then got F. Murray Abrahams, who <laughs> was a dick. <laughs> And I'll tell you that story sometime. Oh my goodness. Both of those other guys were so nice. And he was, but you know, Milos used to say, oh, oh, I'm, I, I'm too smart sometimes for my own good. I mean, Salieri's an asshole and so is he. <laughs> and normally I don't say bad things about people on my cozy tea time, but oh my goodness. I knew we were in trouble when we were flying taking the flight because you had to fly all the way over and like it was quite a long flight you'd flow to Europe and then we had to go on a flight and we went to uh, Czechoslovakia which was communist bloc and I remember when we were on the flight and I there was Tom Holtz and he was really sweet and there was F. Murray Abraham and he was ordering this the stewardesses around and like and eating caviar like by the bucket load and I thought oh dear oh dear and maybe he was just getting into the character who knows but well, I'll tell you the story of that because I have no compunction about telling you this story, even though I try only to be cozy, but I'm not gonna tell it this time because I'm gonna tell something cozy because it's closer to Christmas and I don't wanna tell grumpy stories around Christmas. So he, um, so anyway, but Tom was a sweetheart and we were friends and we went, um, we would go and find places and we were, it was when it was communist block. So I remember flying in to the airport in Czechoslovakia and they strip searched me, strip searched me. I never had strip searched in my life. They had a woman and they had me go into a little room and take off all my clothes, all my clothes. And she searched me and it was very cold in that room. And then they, they let me go out because Milos had defected from Czechoslovakia. And so he was getting to go back. And it was the first time he had been back since he had left. And he was a big director now. And it was bringing a lot of commerce, commerce to Czechoslovakia. But we were surrounded by secret police, which I didn't really, um, it was very, 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 um, very different. Cause that was, uh, it was very different times then. And, um, and there was, it was in the dead of winter. So they didn't have, they didn't have like a lot of different types of food. We were staying at the Intercontinental Hotel and, um, and uh, it was, uh, they, it was, you, you would order stuff. Like you would order a fresh green salad and you'd get sauerkraut and you'd order. And we'd go, like Tom and I would look and we'd try to find a place far away and we could find the menu. So like, oh my goodness, they have a fruit salad on the menu. And then we'd tromp in the snow, there was very deep snow to get to this restaurant, you know, to get the fresh green salad and the fruit salad and because we were so tired of pork and sauerkraut. And, uh, and then we'd get there and we'd order on the menu, the things we wanted, and then it would come and it would be pork and sauerkraut. It didn't matter what you ordered, that's what we'd get. But we did find a lovely little place that had a really good borscht that was, you had to walk across this beautiful bridge in the snow, and I remember you go down on the embankment and there was a little place and it had really, really, really good borscht. That was the first time I'd ever had borscht, but I really loved it, so we went back there and so we were, we were just really good friends. We rehearsed for a very long time. I was there. It took me six months to get the part. Uh, we rehearsed for seven weeks and, um, and, uh, and then they flew us to Italy. I remember they would fly. we were starving. We, they flew us to Italy for our wardrobe fittings with Torelli. Uh, and Fabrizio was the wardrobe uh, designer and he was working with uh, Opera House. Uh, and so Torelli was very fancy as well. And um, they would do our clothes and then they would take us out to, to um, Fabrizio would take us out for dinner. But in dinner in Italy, it wasn't just like you order one thing or one thing, you would get courses of food. And we had just had like pork and sauerkraut for like weeks and weeks and we were so starving for it. And you would have like seven course dinners and we would eat and there would be fresh fruit and fresh vegetables and pasta with delicate sauces and meat courses and fish courses and tiramisu and 
we just ate and ate and ate <laughs> except for then. So, and then we'd go out during the day because we'd have dinner with Fabrizio always. But during the day, Tom and I would go out and we'd get the pizza with the crisp crust on the streets and we'd eat it like orphan children. And then people would be selling blood oranges, which I'd never had on, on the, on the, by the road. And we'd buy those and we'd eat all of those. But then <laughs> when we'd go back, because we were there for around, I don't know, five days or something getting our thing. Every day we went back, we gained weight <laughs> because we were eating so much. And so then they would be like trying to repin and, and they'd say, stop eating, stop eating. And we wanted to stop eating, but we knew we had to store up because we had another six months in, um, in Czechoslovakia. And this was the only good food we were going to get at that time. And so, um, so we just kept on eating and eating and, and that was really fun and because we we had been watching the show that they had in Czechoslovakia. We had worked our days around it where, you know, it, they would show food and they would lovingly have this banquet table full of fruits and vegetables and things you couldn't get in Czechoslovakia and they'd play classical music. And Tom and I sorted our day around that, around watching. like okay, it's coming on. And he'd go to my room, I'd go to his and we'd watch. And that's all we do. We just watch and salivate over the food and go, oh my gosh, grapes. Oh my gosh. Oh, pineapples, cherries. So we were in heaven in Italy, but, um, but they were not pleased with us because we kept gaining weight. Oh, whatever. I'll tell the rest of the story. <laughs> it's going to be a long one, you guys. So then, so then what happened is, is that the day before, so we rehearsed and Milos would shoot and then we rehearsed again and um, just getting it exactly so. Cause I think he wasn't in any real hurry to shoot the whole film because um, because he was in his home home where he grew up, where he had memories and had old friends. And I remember once he took us, he said, I'm going to a special treat for you. I'm going to take you to this special place. And he took us all in these, we were in these cars and they drove us up, up this winding, winding hill to a castle. And he said, this is a very special Czechoslovakian treat. And they brought in these big honking sausages and I cut into them and blood whoosh, oozed all over the plate. It was blood sausage. I'd never had blood sausage. And it was like, and he was so happy. But I've got to think about eating things rare. I couldn't eat it. Um, I didn't want to hurt his feelings, but I didn't like the smell or the taste. So, but anyway, so, okay. So what happened is I loved Constanza. She was one of the favorite my most favorite characters, because it took her from when she was a, a young woman, like 15 or so, like a silly kind of, almost a child, to 30, in her 30s, where she was having to, they didn't have money, where she was having to deal with the, the creditors, where she was having to try to get Wolfi to, to, to finish his work to, you know, and, she, and children. So she got, so she had such a transition and I loved her so much. And then what happened is, the day before I started shooting, I was really nervous. We were all really nervous. It was the day before we were going to start. And so um, a bunch of us went to, they had a, a big gym. It was like in a puffed up dome out uh, where they had a exercise area and a bunch of people were gonna, you know, were doing stuff and they had all kinds of things. And I did a ballet bar and it was just nice to be out and it was snowing outside. And, um, and they were, and a bunch of the crew were putting together a soccer game. And they're like, come on, come on, come play. Cause I'd finished my ballet bar and I'm like, no, 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 I don't, I don't want to, I, I, I you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to get hurt. And they're like, we're just playing a friendly game of soccer. What can it hurt? And, and I, and then they said, we need one more person or the teams won't be even. And I was like, ah, oh, but I just, I just was worried to, but then I thought, oh, they're right. I'm being silly. What can it hurt? And so I was, um, I was uh, put up against, and I, I was really good because I was pretty, you know, sporty when I was a kid and played with my brothers and sisters. We'd play all kinds of games. And so I had run and there was a soccer ball and I was, I, I, there was this one guy who was a big props guy who was huge and I got the ball away and they're like, yay. And when people say, yay, then you do better. And then I was running it down the thing. And, and then, and then another time I got the ball away and I was feeling, yay. You know, everybody said, my team said, and I was running and I looked over my shoulder and I saw the guy's face and he was running towards me. And he was really upset that this little pipsqueak got the ball away and I got scared and my feet got tangled up and I fell. And the minute I fell, 
I knew it was bad. I knew it was really, really bad. And I was like, it's bad. And Tom came running over and his whole face got white. And he's like, are you okay? And I said, I can't, I can't, I can't get up. I couldn't, I couldn't get up. I couldn't stand on it. And he started crying and he ran out and he got a, emptied out a garbage can and ran out and got a garbage can of snow and stuck my foot into it. And, um, and uh, so it would stop swelling because it was just started like swelling up like that. So they took me to a, um, the um, American Consulate Hospital. And I remember that, uh, that the guy who was uh, doing the thing, he was so excited, I guess cause Milos was quite famous, that he was talking to Milos and my foot was out in the, I was in the wheelchair and he didn't open the door. <laughs> and my hurt foot that was sticking out, clunk in the door. And then the doctor said, it's uh, broken. And they took x-rays and said it was broken and uh, put it in a cast. And Milos was like, are you sure? Are you sure it's broken? And he goes, yeah. And, and so Milos said, I want another opinion. So then he snuck me in to a Czechoslovakian hospital where his friend who he'd gone to university with was a doctor who was doctor for the Olympic teams and stuff. So then they did more, more tests and x-rays and he said, no, I'd torn all the ligaments in my ankle and that I, um, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't uh, walk on it. I'd have to have operate surgery immediately within 24 hours, or the um, the the all the ligaments would start shrinking, and you wouldn't be able to reattach them. And my foot could flop like not. I could not use my foot. So I guess it was lucky it happened then. If it was gonna happen, because I got instant care instead of just putting ice and thinking it'll pass. Um, so then they had me in a Czechoslovakian hotel. I mean Czechoslovakian. Um, hospital and they had to sneak me in because I wasn't supposed to be there and I remember the first night they put me in this room and there was an old lady in the room who had um, peed her bed and she was crying and yelling at me in Czechoslovakian to do something but I couldn't speak Czech and they had the windows open uh, because of the smell and the um, snow was blowing in and um, and then a woman came and uh, took me in the in the thing and wheeled me into the sh into the showering room and gave me a hose and um and I didn't know what to do and then she showed like wash off you know mind it out and I was like but it was cold water so I just quickly dabbed water so I'd be wet so she'd think I washed and then did that and then she wielded then she um shaved my leg but it was the, the wrong leg and I was really worried but she didn't um speak any English and I didn't speak any Czech. And so I didn't know what to do. And then they wheeled me down for operation. And then, but I, um, then luckily the, the doctor, doctor, I think his name was Dr. Slavik. No, I don't know what his name was, but anyway, he came out and, uh, and then he started yelling at the lady and blah, 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 blah. And she's blah, blah, blah. And then he said, sorry. And then he came and he's very crazy. He says, I'm so sorry. They made a mistake. You weren't until, tomorrow wielded me back up because I had, um, I guess you had to wait for a certain amount of time before you did. So then I remember the next time or whenever it was or later the operation because he was in his operating stop. Then he, um, then I remember him, um, them putting the thing in so that I would go to sleep. And I remember him saying, uh, okay, count, count back to 10. And he, and then he said, don't roll nuts or whatever, where it's meant good night. Um, and then I only did a few and then I woke up and, um, and I was in my a room and they had me in a private room then. And a woman came in and she had my first meal from after the thing um, and after the operation and it was a hunk of bread and a big hunk of hard salami. <laughs> I'd never seen hospital food like it. It was like a big hunk of, so I ate the, the thing of the hard salami and then, um, my husband, that was my first husband, uh, had flown out. Oh, so, and so then, um, so then, uh, Milos came to visit me in the hospital and he had, uh, three dozen tulips and he, he, um, he said, I, I am, I am so sorry. You can't even know the insurance won't pay for it. If you had shot even just for one day, for one day, the insurance would have paid for it, but they refused to pay. So I, I, I'm so sorry, but we, we have to find someone who will fit in your wardrobe. 
in order to continue shooting. And I was like, it's okay, it's okay. And then I knew I was gonna cry, so I pretended to fall asleep so that so that he, he wouldn't know. And then they're like, oh, she fell asleep. So they tiptoed out, but I wasn't asleep. And then once they left, I just started crying and crying and crying. I was crying so hard, I thought I couldn't stop because I love Constanza and I just couldn't imagine not playing her. But how I knew I was gonna be okay was as I was crying and they the, all the um, tulips had fallen down around my knees and and I, I, that looked goofy. <laughs> so I was crying my heart out. I gathered up the tulips and held them to me because, oh. So that that was uh, that was uh, just really, really heartbreaking. I'd lost the part of my life. Uh, Tim flew out and he was acting very oddly. Um, and uh, a couple days later, a day uh, when I was released from the hospital, we got our stuff and as I was being wheeled out in the wheelchair, uh, three young women who were had been flown out to um, to see if they fit in my clothes were going in the other door, and that was really hard. And then I found out, like a year later, that apparently, so my husband was really upset, and he was treating me really, really um, not worse, <laughs> like really not it was bad it was really bad and i didn't know why and then one day um he came home and he was uh laughing because uh he had said he and he was being all friendly again and i didn't know why and i was very pregnant with emily now and um and he said he had had a conversation and had found out something and then he told me what had happened because Tom and I were just friends, but what had happened is I was in the hospital, I lost the part of my life, and F. Marie Abraham invited Tim up to dinner at the fancy restaurant at the top of the at the top of the hotel. He ordered the most expensive bottle of wine, all kinds of all everything that you have, well pork and sauerkraut, but it was more expensive up there. I never ate up there, not once. And then and then he told him that Tom Holtz and I were having an affair. Like we weren't having an affair. We were friends. Like who would do that? Such a terrible person to do that. And also that, you know, my husband didn't say, hey, I heard this, is this true? So I could like at least defend myself. No, it was the worst type of like meanness that you could possibly do. And I never taught, that man is a terrible man to do something like that to somebody innocent who has never done him any wrong. And there's no way Tom and I, anybody who knows Tom and knows me, n n would know there was no way. We were just friends and Tom was having a hard time shooting and I was, we were just friends. So that, that was a terrible, terrible thing that he did. And I remember I had been offered another film and they offered me a lot of money, but it was working opposite F. Marie Abraham. And I said, no, there's no way I will work with that man ever because because, and they're like, well, you know, it's it, his parts a jerk. I said, I don't care. I said, because I thought if I ever see him, I'm not a violent person, but if I ever see him, I would punch him on the nose. What a horrible thing to do. I, I, what a horrible, horrible lie to tell about somebody. Like how terrible. Anyway, <laughs> oh dear, I wasn't gonna tell you that story. Well, I was gonna break it up. Oh, well, it, it kind of flows one into the other. But anyway, so, okay, that's it. I, I noticed it's quite, okay, I can't just leave you with a terrible story of F. Murray Abraham. Hey, why don't we sing a Christmas carol? I miss my sisters in Christmas carols. This is gonna be a long video, okay? So let I'll sing, and for those of you who don't do Christmas carols, then you can just, you know, scrub off now or turn off or whatever it is. So um, let's see, what, what should we sing? Okay, we'll sing, um, I'll sing, a, I'll sing a song, one of the first songs. My mom used to do this one all the time. She would have a drum. So you'd, I'll, this will be my drum. So she would have a drum and she taught this to her students. She was first grade student. So anybody who knew my mom knows it. So you'd do bum, bum, bum. Willie, get your little drum, Robin, bring your flute and come. Aren't they fun to play upon? 
Pater haller hello, pata pata pan. When you play your fife and drum, how can anyone be glum? Bum, 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 bum. Okay, so that's a. I'm gonna do that actually. I miss singing Christmas carols. My sisters always come for Christmas and they aren't going to this year. So just be forewarned from now until Christmas, every time I do a tea time, I'm gonna do a Christmas carol at the end and you can sing along if you want or not. And those of you who don't celebrate Christmas, you can just be like, oh, she's doing that again. <laughs> and, and so um, so anyway, happy tea time. Sorry this went on so long and, uh, and lots of love to all of you. Bye-bye.